we are live and we are on. So, uh, so those of you watching, this is uh, Howard Silverblatt. He is the senior index analyst at S and P Standard and Poor's. And to start off with, uh, Howard, you know, one of the things that you've done for me is you you have made my life so much better sharing all of the information that you compile every single day. Uh, and a lot of the people listening right now and watching have benefited from that because I then turn around and share it with them. Um, and I just want to know, what is your job at s and to give people a framework for just how valuable your uh, work is? Well, I, first of all, I'm at s and forever. Uh, it's my 44th year. When I came, the s and hit 100. So did Berkshire Hathaway, 100, uh, the same one that's a couple hundred thousand now. Uh, but basically what I do is the S&P Dow Jones indices. Specifically, I deal mostly with the S&P 500, which is domestic, as well as the internationals. But the 500 is our main indice. Uh, obviously, it encompasses the, the vast majority of the uh, U.S. companies on a market value basis, uh, as well as it's 41 percent uh, international. So the revenue is coming from abroad. So it is a global indice, but it's a U.S. one. Uh, my task is to analyze that uh, and control and maintain uh, the indices, along with a lot of other people. That's a, that's a huge job. And, and, and I wanted you to explain that. So as we go into this, people understand that we're talking to the person, the person who is right at the heart of the S&P uh, 500, which brings me to a conversation you and I had not too long ago, which was about the, the concentration of the S&P 500 this year and how few stocks have moved that index up higher. Have you ever seen such a concentration like this? Uh, the, the constant, that's two items. Uh, the concentration itself is unusually high, about the top 10 of about 27%. Uh, the last time we saw anything like this was 1982, 83, uh, when uh, on the top 10 when IBM and AT&T, AT&T before the breakup and IBM, uh, when they were supposed to invent something called PCs and take over the world, uh, prior to that in the early 60s and the late 30s. So while it's happened before, the concentration, the top issues controlling so much of the market value is not a common event. Uh, and it, it, again, we've got a few observations of it, uh, but not that many. Uh, what is happening now, obviously, is with the different names, they control a lot of it. How Apple does, obviously, Microsoft, uh, these companies control a lot of the index because they're moving up. We've had a drastic change since February. COVID came in, uh, and companies have either been profitable or not. And sometimes in extremes. So we've seen the, the good companies go up and those that have not benefited from the situation basically because they have no sales uh, or poor cash flow going down. But I should say this situation was developed well before COVID. We started seeing a significant increase last year. And again, when we're in 2020 now, uh, and the COVID situation just emphasized it by, make, by differentiating the haves and have-nots to some degree. So, so when we look at the, the, the concentration, that also plays into the P.E. ratios. And if you look at the earnings forecasted for 2020, which most people aren't looking at now, they're looking at 2021, I continue to talk about how overvalued the overall market is. And, but you have to play into that, the, the FANGs and the Facebook and the Apple and the Amazons. And coming up to Tesla. And, and Tesla now as, as well. Um, when you look at this, I mean, Tesla is selling at a price earnings multiple of 1400 And yeah, So that 156 on its forward earnings, again, it'll come into the index, just so, so we have the technicalities here, on uh, starting trading on December 21. Uh, the earnings that we use will start to be used for the fourth quarter, but we don't restate Q3, two, and one. So Tesla's impact on the index earnings will not be so much historical as when we look forward to 2021. Go ahead. Well, I was gonna, what I was getting at is that the overvaluation is also something we haven't seen, not only the concentration, but the overvaluation based on 2021 numbers. 
Definitely. Uh, you, you mentioned people can be on to, to 2020. Well, that's good because the 2020 PE is 30, which is so high that you, you're going to get a nosebleed. But even looking to 2021, based on the current estimates, and estimates, as we both know, have a tendency to be optimistic, it's a 22 PE. A 22 PE, historically compared to a, it should be in the 14 to 15 range for that far out. Again, it's a, a full year ahead of us. Uh, and obviously the, the top companies are also getting that higher PE. Uh, while you may look at, at Apple and say it's not astronomically high, it is compared to where it used to sell a year, year and a half ago while using uh, the, the cash flow numbers. So the market definitely has played into the numbers that treatment beats out spread. Uh, in other words, the treatment coming, even though the spread is, is here now and the shutdowns are here now. So the market's playing a lot into it. And, and the earnings show it. We are paying a 22 PE for numbers that we will not finalize for about 15 months. Exactly. I mean, so, and a lot of people don't realize that the earnings expectations goes down as the years go on. So the, Shock and dismay. Excuse me? Shocked and dismayed. Yeah. So, so the earnings estimates right now are at their highest, and they'll go down as the year goes on, which will make those PEs even higher. And if you're looking at a 15 PE uh, that it should be at, and we're looking right now at a, a 22, we're talking about about a 50% overvaluation on the overall index. Uh, maybe not 50, because we're using cash flow as well, and a lot of the, uh, the earnings, are, which have come through nicely, uh, are not as bad. However, you're correct, the, we are discounting that. And if the market does not see that improvement and expected return to whatever the new normal is, uh, which is pricing in mostly for the second half of 2021, it was the first half of 2021, but it's moved out. So if we don't see that, even if, if you want to keep the optimism, you're going to have to move it out at least six months, which means you've got to adjust your, your PE. The only way to do that, obviously, is to pull the price down. If you don't believe in it, you're going to get out of the market. We're going to know pretty quickly if a lot of people do that because it's the buying that's keeping the market up now. We're headed, it looks like, today for a third high this week. Uh, and, you know, when you look at the trades, the physical trades themselves, money managers are staying in. They're not uh, buying and selling, but it's individuals are coming in. So you've got more buying than selling, and it's supporting the market. Well, based, based on history, um, and again, you know, right now you got to toss a lot out, you know, historical data, but based on history, what sectors do you see as attractive out of the S&P? Because there's 11 sectors in the S&P 500. What sectors do you believe look the most attractive right now? On a relative basis, obviously, because they are practically all overvalued by the historical numbers, uh, if you are optimistic, you need to go into the healthcare and technology where we've seen the great, you know, some very good gains, especially on technology. However, if you are not totally buying in the scenario that you know, Q1 brings the, the shots and Q2 and Q3, 2021, you see the improvement physically and, and potentially new records, which is the estimates call for. If you don't do that, you need to go back to hard assets, things that pay a dividend, such as utilities uh, and defensive issues are on there. Again, it's how you, you pick this. You, we see the political environment totally split. Well, so is the market on this. You know, but again, the, the majority of the market, at least by the trades, believes that we are, we are in a, uh, very optimistic and that the treatment will win out and it will, uh, will uh, win out you know, by next year, like second half. When you see the treatment, I don't, I don't know that, that term. Oh, sure. What do you mean? Oh, sure. Um, uh, it's because we're not in the bars anymore. We can't uh, pass on all the items. Uh, early on, it became treatment versus spread. Um, first, it was spread and then treatment. The spread refers to the spread of the COVID virus, obviously, and the impact on closing the economy, reducing numbers, economics, uh, higher unemployment, difficulties with fiscal policy as well, even as the, the monetary Fed to help helps us out. Uh, the treatment is the hope for some kind of a treatment going forward, not necessarily a cure, okay. but something that moves the virus out of the 
death penalty box and puts it more into, gee, I had it for two weeks. It was terrible. I don't wish this on anyone, but I'm okay. Uh, more like a flu to some degree. Uh, and the market is buying in initially in, in February and March, uh, it bought into the spread. Treatment, no one knew what. And we saw a 30, almost a 33% decline in equities. And that March 23, we just started picking up. First couple of months was a rebound as we reevaluate what's happening, but now what's taken over is that treatment, the eventual treatment, whether it be a cure or just uh, uh, again, something that we can control it, get back to work, get back to some kind of normality, whatever redefined normality that will be, will beat out the closings that we're seeing now. You know, yesterday we had a, a trifecta, highest hospitalization, highest uh, death rate, uh, as well as the, uh, the, the seven day was a higher you, uh, you know, Cal California is almost closed at this point in time. Uh, New York, we're worried about it, you know, coming down the road, but the, the street is looking well past this and saying, whatever it's going to be short term, treatment will beat. So right. Right. Now it's treatment keeps out spread. There we go. Now I understand. So, so in looking at the S and P 500, and I know you look at indexes, but you also look at individual stocks. Of all the tech stocks, because everyone seems to just, you know, if it says tech, they buy it, just like they did many years ago with biotech. Anything that said the word bio in it, they would buy. Right now, from a technology standpoint, what do you see as the stock that scares you the most for people to, to stay away from? Yeah, I'm not going to, you're not getting that out of me. <laughs> yeah, you know, what, what I'm concerned about to some degree <clears throat> is the volatility. Okay, and the quick reaction again that that uh, February nineteenth to March twenty third when went went down a third in the market. Yes, it was a quick event uh, happening, and the massive increase we've had now, and the hopes on tomorrow. Uh, there's a lot of money managers out there with their their fingers on the on the button. You know, there's a big profit. We're up over fourteen percent year to date before dividends. I mean, if I would have told you last year, you you know, this year was 14% and unemployment was where it was or the uh, PMI, uh, IMS, I mean, any of these numbers, which have improved, but where they were, you would have wondered what I was drinking or smoking. Right. Uh, bottom line here is we are moved well ahead. So I'm, I'm concerned about volatility. We're concerned about the ability of the market to absorb if everyone starts moving in one direction or another. Again, we, we're seeing support now, mostly from individuals who had stayed in the market with a lot of money on the side. Uh, money managers, they're staying in. As long as people are buying and the, and the stocks are supporting, they're not going to get out. Uh, but if we get some difficulty for whatever reason and, and it gets pulled back, there's a lot of profit on, on, on the line. I mean, window dressing, and profit taking could increase this year. We did not see much in the third quarter because money managers were very active in, in, in reallocating very quickly. But again, 14% Across, you know, across the board, again, energy down significantly, 35, 36%, tech up 34%. Uh, those are for the uh, S&P 500, obviously. Uh, but there's a lot of issues up and a lot down. So volatility, I think, could be a, a difficulty. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm down here in Texas, and the oil business has been destroyed you know, uh, across the board. Um, so we just talk about energy. Do you you starting to see with the with the dollar dropping? You're starting to see the possibility of energy coming back. Yeah, obviously the uh, the possibility of more oil coming on for supply. You know, for my van uh, it, it, uh, when Biden gets in, and obviously the five hundred thousand barrels additional day from uh, OPEC if they stick to those numbers. You know, additional supply is not going to help. Uh, but yes, the dollar definitely, especially with higher increased uh, spending in domestically in the U.S. as, as uh, it's planned, at least it, it's foreseen at this point, uh, we'll, could add to it. We're, we're back up to the $45 range. But again, you go back, oh, it was over $100 and more supply is coming in. So energy has a difficulty. I mean, the 500, as I said, the 35, 36% is pretty bad. Go into the mid cap and the small caps. I mean, those are, are worse. And, and we haven't seen bottom fishing yet. That's what we are looking for in energy. You know, when, when you get this kind of situations, uh, the big companies start going in and saying, okay, it's going to be a difficult time. 
a year, two years, whatever time period we have, uh, but we'll get back on. What do we need for upstream, downstream? What should we buy instead of uh, being a vendor of somebody? Uh, and we haven't seen a lot of that bottom fishing to pick up companies in M&A. Uh, we have seen uh, this week, obviously, uh, reductions in capital expenditures for both Exxon and uh, a Chevron, uh, so, which is not a, a good item. Uh, so energy is definitely has a difficulty here, especially with the U.S. not driving as much. But that, that was the case well before COVID. Uh, you know, it was down uh, not nearly as significantly, but, you know, the, the lack of driving at this point in time and, and the potential for higher supplies could uh, get it from both ends. You know, high supply, lower demand. You, at the very beginning, you talked about what you did, and you said that 41% is international. What do you mean? Do you mean the earnings growth? 41%? No, the, these are the sales. Uh, most companies uh, put out very little information on how much they make abroad. They don't want us to know that I'm mining it in Japan and I'm uh, putting it together somewhere in Europe and selling it in the UK then bringing profits back to the US for cur currencies. Uh, you know, if they did do that, we would all set up matrix and plug in the currencies and know that when an event happens, which companies to do and which don't. Those that do do it, uh, paint a picture of about 41% or so being international sales. Very few of them give the actual uh, uh, earnings. And then when they do, it's usually operating and before taxes and international taxes is not somewhere we want to go uh, in general. Uh, but about 41% of them are produced as well as sold abroad. So it may be Canada and sold in the UK or whatever, but it is not an export from the US. So a good part of the S&P 500 is abroad. Uh, and to some degree, even though they're US companies, it's an international industry to some degree. And, and that's what scares me the, the most is that the world economy has not come back. I mean, you look at what's happening in Europe, they have negative interest rates, Japan has negative interest rates. And the idea that a lot of the growth in our S&P 500 companies come from outside the US, I think we're being blind to the fact that, that it's not just the United States that we have to be concerned about, it's the rest of the world. De definitely. De but that, that is the tail part, but it is a large part. I mean, you've got, you know, think of a customer base and 41% of yours, you know, go up and down there. Uh, it is a concern and you do see plays that way every once in a while. We have actually indices as is other companies, you know, for, for, for playing those kind of items. Uh, but yes, the, the earnings abroad are not as good uh, as we're seeing in the US. We are ahead of them in that at this point Time. Some of the consumer groups uh, report a little bit better, uh, and you know, when it's more discretionary. So you'll see that from the higher end, like a Tiffany's, also McDonald's, enormous amounts abroad uh, on there. But yes, that is a big component. If you're analyzing and looking at the earnings per share, you need to look at the global. Again, not the biggest engine, but it's an important engine, and it makes a big, uh, a big difference what the uh, the rates are, the exchange rates. Right. Uh, the hedging is doing uh, and where we stand. Uh, again, the, the U.S. markets uh, have been uh, the one pulling the, the weight this year. Uh, this month, they uh, brought November, abroad uh, did better, but year to date, it's uh, the S&P 500 that, and, and the U.S. Uh, market that's holding the globals up. So my, my last question for you, there's an equal weighted S&P 500, and then there's the capital weighted S&P 500. And historically, the equal weighted has outdone the capital weighted. At least that's what I've been told. Is that in, gen in, in, in general, it's the math of it, yes. Okay. And so in order to, if, if somebody wanted to invest in the equal weighted S&P 500, which means that um, I guess it'd be 0.2% of every company would be represented, or you would be represented by point. 0.2% of every stock would be in that index. How would you allocate money to that through the S&P? Well, you'd, you'd obviously buy uh, an S&P instrument. I mean, if you're using the S&P 500 and uh, you can go on and, and get those through many vendors, uh, brokerage houses, some do private ones on there. Again, the, uh, the equal weighted, again, all companies are equal. They get be weighted over time, but whether the, uh, 
the smallest company goes up 10% and the biggest company goes down 8%, the index up uh, on the capital side, you know, it's the opposite. It's the uh, concentration that we spoke of. But yeah, there's, there's many instruments that you can go in to and, and do that. As far as a percentage, it depends on your full allocation. Uh, I don't mean to be difficult on this question, but you've got all your sectors and, and all your investments need to be taken together. You need to look at everything, what the liquidity, what the, the numbers, are, numbers are, and what you're exposed to. If you have a, uh, a dividend uh, fund and it's all utilities, well, you've got a utility exposure. It's not that it's good or bad, but if you do not know that, just like the 500 you point out, you know, that's 41%, you need to know it. So again, the uh, equal weight fits in there. Uh, traditionally, it, it, it does better, however, not all the time. So Howard Silverblatt, you're, as I said at the beginning, you've been a godsend to me. So thank you very much for your hard work. Everybody, this has been Howard Silverblatt, the senior uh, index analyst at S&P Standard & Poor's. And uh, Howard, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Thank you.